Hello. Well, I don't need that kind of hello, but thank you for that hello. It's so great to see all of you. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's get started, I, because I, I, I want to talk to you about a lot of things. This is today's outline. Every week, I will begin with an outline of what we're going to talk about. I'll also summarize the, the things that I think are absolutely critical for you to have learned the previous week from lecture and from sections. Uh, today's outline, introduction, and then we're going to talk about something that I call the paradox. This course, in terms of my philosophy of teaching, is not about answering questions. It's about raising questions and getting you to think much harder and more deeply than you have thought, presumably, about many of the issues that you may maybe take for granted. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is start with a paradox. We're going to talk about inequality by race. Uh, it is impossible to talk about income and wealth inequality in the United States and many other places around the world without talking about structural racism. They can be theoretically looked at separately, but they are integrated and intertwined in so many fundamental ways, and we will examine that literally every week. Uh, and then economic mobility. And let me just say something about that before we get into it. We are not only going to be examining the distribution of income and wealth, but we're also going to be exa examining a first cousin, which is how easy it is for somebody who is born relatively poor or very poor or lower middle class or working class, whatever you want to define it, to move up. That's another very critical part of the story and the questions that we will be addressing. And finally, today, we're going to be looking at a kind of a pretty basic question. Should you care about widening inequality of income and wealth? Is it something that we should be spending a lot of time on? And, but, but exactly why, if it is something you should care about? So we'll get into all of this. But first of all, in terms of introductions, uh, there is a kind of social contract. This is something I'm going to be talking about again and again in the course. Because some of you are political science majors, and some of you are economics majors, and some of you are sociologist majors, and some of you are history majors. Uh, but this course is interdisciplinary in the sense that, in my view, my humble view, after having been engaged with this subject, academically and research-wise, and also in terms of administering and running programs, my view is that you can't separate economics, politics, sociology, and history. They're academically separate silos, but for this course, we are going to be integrating them entirely. And the social contract is a very fundamental part of what we will talk about explicitly or implicitly. And by social contract, I mean what we owe each other as members of the same community in this classroom, or community as in Berkeley, University of California, or community as in Berkeley town, or community as in East Bay, or community as in people who inhabit the United States. or as human beings, what do we owe each other? We're very comfortable talking about rights. We have a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. What about a Bill of Responsibilities? We all together are a learning community. I don't believe that a course is a, uh, is a kind of place where a professor or a lecturer kind of depart, gives you information. That's just a waste of time. You can get information from a book, a text. No. 
the sections and this classroom are places where you are hopefully inspired to ask yourself hard questions. One of the best ways of learning I have found in my life is to discuss something with somebody who disagrees with you. Now, we have a little bit of a problem here at Berkeley in that the consensus is very strong. It's hard to find a lot of people who disagree with the dominant view that I would assume many of you have. But that means that in sections, and to the extent that we in this course have a chance to actually discuss things, we have to prize, respect, and protect people who have what might be considered to be dissenting views. They are incredibly valuable to us. And if you do have a, quote, minority or dissenting view, not only should you be respected, but also, you, obviously, that discussion is the essence of learning for everybody. So you are a gift to us. Uh, introductions, uh, who I am. Who am I? Well, I, uh, I've been teaching here at Berkeley for maybe 17 or 18 years. I never expected it was going to be that long. Before that, uh, I was teaching at a university called Brandeis. Before that, at a university uh, called Harvard. Uh, and uh, along the way, I also was in the Bill Clinton administration. I was an economic advisor to Barack Obama. Before that, I was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Before that, in terms of public work, I was director of the policy planning staff of the Federal Trade Commission in the Carter administration. You've heard of the Carter administration. <laughs> Ancient history. Ah, but before that, I was assistant to the Solicitor General in the Ford administration. Am I getting into ancient history for you? Yeah. And, and before that, I was, I was special assistant to Abraham Lincoln, as many of you, <laughs> you know that. Um, those were very, very tough times. Uh, but I've been, uh, so uh, what I'm trying to, tell you is that I'm bringing to this course uh, some experience. Uh, what else can I tell you? I've written a lot of books. My books are the kind of books that once you put them down, you can't pick them up. No, that's, <laughs> that's a, bad, a bad joke. Uh, that's all you need to know about me. Uh, in terms of I, you, uh, I've talked about what this course is about. Oh, one more point about the course. We are looking at the United States because that's where we get a lot of data. No other country has as much data, detailed data about wealth, income, inequality, and so on, as the United States. Uh, but if you are an international student, or if you're interested in inequality, or a widening inequality of income and wealth, and other things in other countries, hopefully what we begin to uncover here in this course about the United States will be useful to you because many of the trends that have occurred in the United States are beginning to occur elsewhere. That is, the United States seems to be the leader, quote unquote, in many of these dilemmas. Uh, who you are, uh, here's where the clicker exercises come in. So get ready. Hopefully. Uh, so this is the first question. This is the first clicker exercise, starting with something very easy about you. Uh, when somebody asks you, where are you from? You're most likely to say, A, California. B, somewhere else in the United States. Or C, another nation. Now, what I do in the clicker exercise, these polls, I'll put something like this up. And then I'll say to you, go. And what go means is consider it. It doesn't have to be a perfect answer. Nobody's going to know. This is anonymous. I mean, nobody outside 
the CIA has any idea what you are just clicking. That was a joke, bad, another bad joke. Nobody knows, it's completely anonymous. And then I will say after a few seconds, I'll say, all right, end the bidding. Now it's been 22 seconds, let's end the bidding there uh, and let's see what the results are. So you can see 71% of you, 376 are from California. Uh, this is a public university. I'm not surprised, it's the best public university in the world. It's true, it is true. Uh, and then, uh, but we've got a number of you from somewhere else in the United States, and then about uh, 70 of you, that is 13% from another nation. Uh, so there is a little bit of diversity. One out of eight people in the United States lives in California. And let's go to question two. More about you, okay? Uh, my major or major area of interest falls into the following category. A, economics. B, politics, political science, or other social science. Or C, humanities. Or D, sciences or mathematics. Or E, the arts. Go. And let's end the bidding there and see well, it's a kind of a cross section. We've got uh, we've got a 16% economics, and then we've got a lot of, about a third of you politics or other social science. 10% of you in the humanities. Almost 40% of you sciences or math and the arts. Only 13 of you are in the arts. Well, good for you. <laughs> okay, more about you. Okay, when I was growing up, and this is actually more uh, self-revelation that is relevant to the course, certainly. When I was growing up, I would say my family was A, wealthy, purely subjective, right? B, upper middle class or professional. C, middle class. D, working class. E, low income or poor. Again, subjective, go. And let's end the bidding there and see, sort of, again, understanding subjectively. There's a big bunch of you say upper middle class or professional. A small number say wealthy. But then the rest of you are spread out. Middle class, working class, low income or poor. I want to just stress the subjectivity here. Uh, when I was growing up uh, in a rural area of New York State, I discovered when I was in my 20s, not until I was in the 20s, that we actually were quite poor. But I didn't know it because everybody around me was poor. That is, you don't know much about where you are situated economically if everybody around you is pretty much the same. It's only when you get a sense of relativity that you learn more about your situation. Relativity. Keep that word in your head because we're going to be talking about relativity later on. Uh, this is interesting. This is the self-reported incoming undergraduates at UC Berkeley, just the most recent data we could find. And one thing that sort of struck me as interesting is that as you get lower income, working class, lower income, more and more transfer students. Now that's not surprising when you think about it because a lot of people who are lower income or poor, they start at community colleges and they do very well or they presumably do well because that's the way, that's the only way they could transfer to a place like University of California, Berkeley. So what you see is a University of California system that is actually an extraordinary vehicle of upward mobility for a lot of poor or lower income young people. Not ideal, obviously, a lot of things wrong with it, but there is a vehicle that should be evident from this graph. Now we get to the paradox. And maybe the best way of explaining this paradox is to take a look at what has happened to economic growth in the United States in the post-war era. Now we're starting here uh, before 1950, around 1946. A lot of what we do in this class starts around the end of the Second World War. 
because that is, by just arbitrary definition, the modern era where a lot of economic decisions and political decisions have been made about the structure of the economy. 1946 is a key year. It's a key year because I was born in 1946. <laughs> it's a key year because George Bush and Bill Clinton and Donald Trump were all born in 1946. All of us within about five months of each other. We waved at each other as infants. <laughs> Dolly Parton, 1946. You heard her at the beginning of the course. She is a part of this course. She lives inside me. I want to meet her. I want to meet her. I mean, she is my height. We, we, we believe in the same things. I don't know why I have gone so long without meeting Dolly Parton. If any of you know Dolly Parton or somebody who knows Dolly Parton, please get to work. There's not a lot of time. Uh, and you know who else was born in 1946? Cher. I mean, anybody who was anybody was born in 1946. And so we start with uh, 1946, and the question, uh, in fact, I'm going to reveal it to you right now, is what happened to the US economy beginning after the Second World War, and this is adjusted for inflation, Wow, that's called economic growth. And you see at the end, I mean, this is the recession, pretty bad recession, the pandemic recession. But right now, we're sort of right there. And later on in the course, we'll talk about what the Fed is doing uh, that may push us back down here. But this record, again, adjusted for inflation, by that I mean we're talking about real purchasing power, this is an extraordinary record. Well, great, and then the question is, well, who has got all of that economic gain? Productivity and the typical worker's wage compensation. Uh, now here, again, let me pause to explain something. Very often in the course, I'll put on the bare bones of a graph. And some of you may be graphophobes. You may see a graph and just freeze. So what I want to do pedagogically is explain it before I show you what the graph is and why it's important. Now, this, this graph that I'm about to show you will show you over time what has happened to the median wage, median, that is half above, half below the wage of the typical worker in the United States over time. And I'm also going to compare that in this graph to productivity, how productive the typical worker has been. And what you will see is that productivity of the typical worker and wages of the typical worker rose together in tandem which is not surprising. That's what we thought was the rule. In fact, when I was in the Federal Trade Commission in the 1970s, and we were starting with a bunch of economists, we looked at the wage data and labor data, and we saw that, yes, wages went up, and productivity went up, and they went up together. But then I noticed something, and I remember saying to the, the other economists I was working with, uh, but there's something going on here. They're starting to depart. They're starting to separate. Productivity is continuing to go up, and wages are starting to stagnate a little bit. And the other economists that I shared, that I was the director of policy planning, but they were part of the policy planning staff, and they said, no, that can't be right. I said, well, look at the data. Hello. They said, no, that wouldn't happen. Well, let me show you what has happened. And again, we're going to look at productivity growth and hourly compensation beginning in, and, and we're going to set it at cumulative change. And this is since 1948. So we're looking at how changes in the median wage starting in 1948, could have been 1946, 
continued to go up together, and then I was starting to see something around here. Right, 1979, 1980, and this was what I was starting to see. Productivity was continuing to rise faster than the median wage. What was that all about? How did that happen? Why did that happen? Why that gap? That's a paradox. It was a paradox in 1978, 79, 80, when I noticed it and began talking about it, and other people began talking about it, and it became more and more of an oddity. We'll talk more about it. But the question for you is, Well, I want to show you this. This is, the, this is current dollars. Uh, this is why, in, if you don't adjust for inflation, none of this makes, most, makes sense. Just look at the constant. This is in 2018 dollars. In terms of real purchasing power, uh, in 1964, the real purchasing power of average hourly wages in the United States uh, was $20.27. And, and then you get to 2018, the latest, the latest data that we have confidence in, and it's $22.65. So over this entire period of time, uh, you know, a very long period of time when the United States economy is growing dramatically, the typical worker, average hourly wage, is not any better off in terms of real purchasing power. This has huge social and political implications. So where did most of the economy's gains go? This is another clicker question, but this is more complicated than the other clicker questions I've given you. Uh, a, uh, into business investment. Most. Or B, into government programs for the poor. Or C, into to people who are already wealthy. Or D, into environmental protection, public health, infrastructure, education, military expenditures, basic research. Where did you think, where do you think most of the economy's gains, since the median wage stayed flat and the economy kept growing? Well, they must have, those gains must have gone somewhere. Where did they go? Go. Now, Let's end the bidding right there, and let's see what you think. Uh, a few of you, 8% think it went, they went into business investment. Uh, well, some of it did, certainly. And uh, into government programs for the poor, not, well, you don't think. Only, if you don't think, they did. And then most, 83% of you think it was people who were already rich. What a cynical bunch of people you are. Uh, and then uh, into environmental protection, and not very many. Well, let's take, let's take a look. As we get into the course, the reason these clicker polls become useful is they help you to think and ask yourself questions, and then they also guide me in terms of helping give you not exactly the answers, but data. And the data is, since 1980s, here's what's happened. And again, we're using 1980 as the beginning. We're, we're looking at the relative to 1980. What happened to wages? Well, we can see that wages of the bottom 90%, the bottom 90%, uh, wages relative to what they were in 1980, well, they rose a little bit. Now, I'm not talking about median. Median is half above, half below. I'm talking about the bottom 90%. Uh, and then we say that, that the top 1% uh, did much, much better. Look at that. Their earnings, their change in earnings relative to 1980, quite dramatic. And then the top one-tenth of 1%, well, that's
a fairly powerful reality. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, maybe it's inevitable, maybe it's not a problem, but at least we are seeing the same data. Income growth has changed a lot in the last 30 years. I'm going to put on the slide, I'm going to give you a graph that shows whose income grew the most. If you're down at the bottom of the income ladder, how much growth do you get? If you're at the top of the income ladder, how much growth do you get? But we're going to do something kind of complicated to this graph. And this is going to, I'm just warning you, this graph is going to take you, even you graphophiles, even people like me who loves love the visual dem demonstration of, of, of information, uh, you might choke a little bit on this graph. Are you ready? I just want to prepare you. OK. Did somebody say, wow? <laughs> you said, wow. I like that. people say, wow. Do you know why you said, wow? Why? I mean, <laughs> why? Because it looks. It's sort of shocking. Uh, but for those of you who are not quite with us, we're, we're com what we're doing is we're comparing 1980. And we see in 1980, most of the growth in income was in lower income people. By 2014, look, by 2014, look where the growth is. And let's just be very specific. The poor and middle class used to see the largest income growth. But now, and maybe, Nikki, we can move that poll over so people can read that. Uh, but now, the very affluent, the 99.999 percentile, see the largest income growth. In other words, what we've seen is a dramatic shift in the structure of the economy. More dramatic than a lot of people know. Again, is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Well, let's hold that off. But let's at least see how dramatic the change has been. Uh, and when I talk about the suspension bridge, what I'm really talking about is a longer time series. If you go back all the way back to the 1914, 1915, we're not going to do this very often, but I want to take the largest view. And what I want to show you is something that is quite amazing. To me, it's quite amazing. Because what we see when we take the long view is that in the, between 1912 and 1930, beginning of the Great Depression, we had the top 1% had a lot of the total income of this country. And down here is the top half of 1%. The top half of 1% had a lot of the total income in the 20s and early 1930s. But then as the Great Depression wore on, as we went into World War II, as we went into, well, after I was born, and Bill Clinton and Dolly Parton, uh, something happened. Uh, and we had the greatest degree of equality we've had. The top 1% had a, the l smallest percentage of total income. This is before taxes. And then around 1980, we started to go back to where we were. And that's why I talk about it as a suspension bridge, because we seem to be repeating some sort of historic cycle or reality. And one of the paradoxes we've got to unravel in this course, it's not economics, it's not political science or politics, it's not exactly sociology, is what happened in the middle. Why this period of time, roughly from the end of the Second World War through the 1980 or a little bit after 1980, why did we see the economy acting, functioning, so differently than it had before or since? 
What was exceptional then? Now, I should tell you another thing about the course here. The first six weeks, we're going to be examining why. What happened? We're going to look at the why from a lot of different angles and dimensions. And then the last half of the course, we're going to be looking not so much at the why, we're going to be looking at, well, what do we do about it? Or if we're concerned about it, what are the policy areas and the policy implications? But we can't get to the policy part of the course until we answer the why part of the course. Because policy talk, without understanding what actually happened, is an exercise in futility. Some of you, in fact, next week we're going to be talking about capital markets, some of you may have a tendency to want to vilify certain people Elon Musk, I don't know, whoever, whoever you want to vilify, people who are very rich, powerful, uh, I'm going to try to discourage that. Because making this about certain bad people misses the essence of what happened and also makes it impossible to have an intelligent policy discussion. Because this is not about anybody behaving badly. Or to put it slightly differently, uh, th throughout this entire period of time, there are people that behave badly. You always have people that behave badly. But what do we mean, behave badly? And everybody is working within a system. The question is, what changed about the system? Now, this is important. This is one we once grew together. This is between 1947 and 1979. But this shows you that the lowest fifth, the poorest fifth of Americans, they grew during this period in terms of income, not height, in terms of income, grew more than even the top fifth. This was a period of time when we all, all inhabitants of the United States, grew together by income. Now, I don't want to glorify this period of time. I mean, women were still second-class citizens. Black people, Latinos, were still second-class or third-class citizens. This was not a, glor a, a glorified, wonderful time. But in terms of the narrow issue we are examining particularly with regard to income, there is an extraordinary sort of growing together phenomenon. Now contrast this with the period right after this. This is just before the Great Recession. And I, 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 I bracket this before the Great Recession because the Great Recession, we will see, changed a lot of the structure of the economy. But look at what happened between 79 and 2010 in terms of the lowest fifth got poorer. The top fifth started to move away from everybody else. Now, we're not talking about the top one-tenth of one percent. We're talking about the top fifth, the top 20 percent. Something, something happened in this period of time. What happened? Uh, we have not yet talked about wealth. We've talked about income. Now, I want to say something about wealth. Wealth is different from income in some very, very important ways. Income is measured as a flow of earnings over a certain period of time, usually a year. This is my yearly income. This is what I report if I'm reporting my income to the IRS, this is my income for this year. It's a flow. Wealth 
is the result of that flow. Wealth is, uh, wealth concerns my assets, where I put my income. I may put my wealth into the stock market, or I may to put my savings and wealth and savings, what we're talking about, if I have any at all, I might put it into a house. Or I might put my wealth into a someplace else to keep it. A pension plan, stock market, wherever you put your wealth, if you have any savings, your savings are basically what we're talking about. Wealth results from that flow, total assets at a particular time. But here's the thing, income also flows from wealth. What do I mean by that? If you have a bunch of stocks, you're, you, have a lot of, uh, a lot, you have a lot of value in the stock market, you might get dividends from the companies you own, or the little pieces you own of companies. Dividends are the companies basically giving you a little, little piece of your ownership stake back per year. Not all shares of stock have dividends attached to them, but a dividend would be an example of making some money off of your wealth. Or you might own an apartment building, and you get rent from that apartment building. The apartment building is your wealth, and the income from your renters is income from that wealth. Uh, the reason I'm talking about all of this is people get very confused. And policymakers even get very confused about all of this. I mentioned Jeff Bezos, for example, Elon Musk. Uh, what, how do they live? What do they live on? They don't live on their wealth. Their wealth is in the stock market, in shares of stock of Telsa, Tesla, or shares of stock of Amazon or whatever shares of stock they have. No, what they do is they borrow money from the bank, usually a big bank, and use their shares of stock. They're huge, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars as collateral to get pretty good terms on a bank loan. And they live off of those loans. I'm looking at your faces, and I would say 20% of you have no idea what I just said. But we'll come back to that. Don't worry about it. Um, income from wealth, uh, this is also important. The top 1%, here is the top 1%. Uh, more and more of the top 1%, this is a time series, again, starting in the late 70s, 1980, going all the way up as close as we can get to the present time in terms of good data. You can see that the top 1% is getting more and more and more of their income from their wealth. Again, my scanning of your faces. If you understand what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. We will come back to this. This will become very, very clear to you. The readings make these, these things very clear. Uh, total family wealth. This should be very clear to you. Here's the top 10% in terms of wealth. This starts in 1989. Going through 2020, this is the top 10% in terms of total wealth. This is the, this goes up to the, almost the 90th percentile. This is the bottom 90% of Americans in terms of the total wealth that they have accumulated. That's the thing about wealth. It's very hard to accumulate it. If you're not earning very much, you may never accumulate wealth. Most people, and we're, again, we're talking about in the United States, accumulate almost no wealth. The wealth they have is probably in their homes, in the value of their houses. If they don't have a house, if they're renting, then maybe their wealth is in the value of their car. And if they don't have a car, then maybe their wealth is in a savings account. 
But most people, relative to the top 10%, relative to the top 1%, have almost no wealth. This, again, is important for you to understand in terms of the structure of the economy and how the structure of the economy has changed. And it's important for you to understand in terms of what has happened to politics. Everything we are talking about has a correlate in the sociology and the politics of this country. And I might add, those of you who are international students, if you are in France, if you are in Britain, if you are from Scandinavia, you see a similar pattern emerging, emerging, not quite this extreme. The wealth held by the richest 400 Americans, the richest 400 Americans, as a percentage of the total US economy, let's take a look. Starting in 1980, this is just 400. You get the picture. This is not blaming them. Let me hasten to say, this is not about them being bad or wrong or doing something that is nefarious. This is simply about what has happened. The 18 richest American families' wealth as a share of total U.S. wealth. Let's look at just the 18. Just the 18. Now let's pause and look at what all of this has meant in terms of racial categories. Now you know, you've taken courses, you understand, you are sophisticated enough to know that race is a social construct. But it's a social construct that has consequences, social consequences, in terms of racism. And not just racism today, but a history that becomes more and more important to explaining where people are today. Which of the following is true? Now, sometimes I'm going to give you these kinds of questions, and they are intended, and you've got to understand, they are intended to just be a little bit of a brain teaser. I mean, I just want you to suffer a little bit. Not, not suffer. I just want you to go, hmm, hmm. Just a little bit of a, of a, not very hard, but just a little bit of a difficulty. Uh, so this one, and I do this, which of the following is true? Only one of the following is true. Now, which is it? I will, I will go through each of them. Uh, a, the real, the racial wage gap. Wages between black people and white people, between black people and Latino people, the, the racial wage gap is larger than the racial wealth gap. That's A. B, the typical white family's financial assets are three times that of the typical black or Latinx or Latino family. Or C, relative to 1979, the income of the typical black female has increased while the income of the typical white male has declined. One of these is true. Which is it? Go. Okay, let's end the bidding there. And then let's, instead of my telling it to you, let's just look at the data. Oh, let's, uh, we probably ought to look at what you say. 
I would say, so most of you say B is the one that's false. The typical white family's financial is three times that of a typical black family. Uh, and uh, relatively few of you say A. Uh, and then uh, relatively few of you say C. OK, so most of you are bunched around the typical white family's financial assets are three times that of a typical black or Latinx family. Uh, well, let's just see. Uh, these are changes in wages by race, starting in 1979. Again, 7980 is the critical beginning of something. Something happened. Uh, and uh, let's just take a look at this. Well, what's interesting here is this is relative to 1979. Relative to 79, interestingly, we see that black women have done, relative to where they were in 1979, they've done pretty well. And white men, relative to where they, in 1979, really have, are, are worse off. Well, that's important for a lot of reasons we will come back to. The racial wealth gap is substantially greater than the racial income gap. Let's take a look. Because wealth, again, is a cumulative effect. And you can see that the racial wealth gap here are white people in terms of the wealth that they have since 1963, adjusted for inflation, incredibly increase, well, very substantial increase in wealth. But here we have black and Hispanic or Latino families not really keeping up at all. So there's a big difference here. The racial wealth gap is much greater than the racial income gap. And the mean value of financial assets in the United States by race is at three times white people. It's much more than three times. So that's the data we have. The answer was it had to do with, paradoxically, black women doing much better since 70, relative to 79, than white men, relative to 1979. Now, all of this is intended just to get your mind making you curious. How is it, what's happened? What, a lot of very dramatic things have happened over the last few decades. Well, what were they? Now, we've got to be careful with measurements. And I, 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 in your readings, I just want to put a little bit of a, of a warning sign. Uh, average and median are different. Those of you who have taken courses it, anything to do with mathematics or anything to do with measurements, you, under, you understand this. Because median is uh, halfway between the people at the top and the people at the bottom. And the average can be brought up just because you have a lot of wealth or a lot of something at the top. The basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot two. What does that tell you? It tells you almost nothing. Uh, also, beware individual household or family. Some of these measurements, and most of the measurements, most of the data we have, ultimately come from both the Labor Department and the Commerce Department of the United States, some state data as well. Uh, they st some of them are family. Some of them are individual. Some of them are household income or wealth. Just beware. It could be that it's confusing if you're comparing apples and oranges. 
Uh, the other thing to be aware of is whether we're talking about before taxes and transfers or after taxes and transfers. And we'll come back to this. These are just warning flags. Now, in everything you've seen so far, I have controlled for all of these. But when you read all of your readings or all of the additional readings, and by the way, each week, uh, we've come up with readings that we, GSIs and I, think are really quite essential. But then there are additional readings for those of you who want to get into the details. And I hope you have the time and inclination to do some of the additional readings. But my point is, some of this, you just have to be ask yourself, well, are they talking about before, after taxes and transfers? Also, beware of the measures of inflation. Because I've said now in this class several times, when we look at time series, I've said adjusted for inflation. Well, yes, you have to adjust for inflation if you want to actually talk about the real purchasing power of the dollar, of a wage, or whatever it is. But there are different measures of inflation. They're not all exactly the same. It depends on what the market basket of goods is that you are measuring and comparing. Also, beware of the difference between income inequality, spending inequality, and wealth inequality. Some of the readings, I mean, in fact, there's a, there are a whole bunch of people out there who say we should not worry about income inequality as long as there is rough spending equality. Maybe they're right. Also, samples, racial statistics. I mean, a lot of the US government data on race, for example, bunches all Asians together. Can you imagine anything? more absurd. You're taking a big chunk of the entire world that happens to be in the United States, and you're saying they're all the same, and we're going to treat them all the same? Well, a lot of these categories are left over from years before, when it didn't seem quite as absurd to categorize. But we've got to be aware of how foolish some of these categories might be or become. OK, uh, mobility. As I said to you earlier, another dimension of all of this, besides income inequality and wealth inequality, we've got to look at how easy it is for somebody to move up or fall down. I mean, if there's a lot of mobility, if you, uh, born into a poor family, can very easily become wealthy through just working and playing by the rules, then it's less of a problem than if you're born poor and you can never get anywhere. So let's take a look at mobility. Uh, this is a question for you. It's a yes, no question. We can do it quite quickly. Are you satisfied with opportunities to get ahead in America by working hard? A, yes. B, no. Go. OK, let's end the bidding there and see what you think. Overwhelmingly, 73% of you say no. 27% of you say Yes. Uh, this is, if there's any social compact in the United States, this is sort of the essence of the social compact. Everybody ought to be able to get ahead by working hard, by playing by the rules. But if you can't, something's wrong. Something's profoundly wrong. Now, I don't know what is in your heads when you say no. But let's take a look at the way this question has been answered over the last 20 years by a random sample of Americans, uh, well, most of them disagree with you. Most of them say uh, they're satisfied with the opportunity to get ahead by working hard. But interestingly, if you look at the trend line just over the last 20 years, the trend line is downward. And anybody who has followed polls, particularly opinion polls, and they're flawed in all sorts of ways. But one thing that's interesting 
and Gallup does this quite well, is that even a fall of 10% is significant. It signals something. This too, we will come back to. Social mobility by the percentage of children. Now here, I've got to explain again before I put this up and confuse you. We're going to look for each quintile, each 20% of income group, how easy it is for the children in that income group to get into a higher income group. So let's just take a look. And if you really want to look hard, what we're looking at here is a child born in the bottom 20% by income. 43% of those children are stuck in the bottom. They never get out of the bottom 20%. By contrast, here, 40% of the children born in the, the top 20%, in the top quintile, are stuck at the top. They never get out of the top. They stay in the top. Now, this is a picture. This is the la these are the last, the most recent data we have that I have confidence in. Uh, I, I think things have changed a little bit. I'm not sure which direction. But the point is that relative to most other so-called rich nations, we now have less mobility. Down or up? Depending on who you are born to in terms of your income class, that says a lot about what you're going to be in for the next 20, 30, 50, 80 years. So the best way to do well in America is to be born rich. I hate to say it like that, but it's sadly true. Or maybe it's positively true. I, I just put an evaluation in. Uh, I don't know whether it's sad to me. There are problems associated with lack of mobility. The percent of US children earning more than their parents at age 30. Now, this is really important. In terms of the morale and the sense of fairness and optimism, remember, I was born in 1946 along with Bill Clinton and, and George W. And, and Donald Trump and Dolly Parton and, and Cher. And, and that was a time when everybody assumed that they would do better and their children would do better than they did. And they were right to make that assumption. Because most children and then grandchildren did better than their parents. You see how that can have an effect on group psychology, the national understanding of the collective social compact. And if that stops, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Now, we're talking about children born here. We're going up to 1984. Children born in 1984 who, by the age of 30, are now you know, getting up there. They have their own children. They have their own careers. They have their own. Uh, well, that's a pretty good way of viewing it. Well, let's see. Only half of children born in the early 80s were making more than their parents by age 30. In 1940, 1945, 92% of children were, by the age of 30, earning more than their parents.
We need to understand why. We also need to understand the implications of all of this. Now finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is should we care? And the reason I even bring this up is because there are a lot of voices out there that say we should not. And I want to talk to you about their arguments. Because it's very important in this class, in your sections, very important that we understand all of the arguments and that we respect those arguments, but we have to at least understand what the arguments are. Uh, should we care? No. One of the no reasons why we should not care about widening inequality of income and wealth and also lack of mobility is that the rewards of great wealth fuel entrepreneurship from which we all benefit. Or to say that in a slightly less highfalutin way, without inequality, or at least some inequality of income and wealth, there would not be enough incentive for people to invent and create businesses and create jobs. You need those incentives. That's what the argument would be. And when you do have incentives, when people are inventive, when Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and a lot of others are creating and inventing, we all benefit. Secondly, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not as if a dollar that goes to the very super wealthy is a dollar less than you, that you or somebody who is poor has a possibility of, of having or earning. No, it's not, it's not a zero-sum. Their wealth doesn't depend on somebody else's poverty. We can all rise together. We could. We did in the early you know, between 1946 and 1980, you saw the graph. And so those people who say we shouldn't worry about it will say, well, wait a minute. I mean, there are things we should be doing, maybe about poverty, but we don't have to bring the wealthy down. We don't have to tax the wealthy. We don't have to, we don't have to uh, worry about inequality. We can remedy poverty without reducing inequality or wealth. And we just focus on poverty. Since I came to the Bay Area, I've seen more and more and more poverty. It's evident to all of us. It's around us. There are more people living on the street. There are more homeless people. Well, this argument would be, if you want to do something about that, we can do it. Let's focus on getting that done. It doesn't mean we've got to reduce inequality, because it's not a zero-sum game. And finally, the arguments of those who say, don't worry about this, are targeting the rich is socially divisive. I was on television not too long ago uh, debating with a fellow who I served with in the Clinton administration named Larry Summers. And uh, we were talking about this issue. And Larry kept on saying, why do you continue, Bob, why are you continuing to attack the rich? That's socially divisive. Why are you doing that? We don't need to do that. I said, I'm, I'm not attacking in any individual person, and I'm not even ta attacking the rich. And Larry said, it certainly sounds like you are. So I want to play a little bit of a game. So occasionally, in this class, we'll do something that is a game. And the purpose of the game is to elucidate, to help you understand your own values and our collective 
social contract. Uh, and this is a, a I'm going to play a genie, uh, kind of a, an abstract genie, obviously. And when I snap my fingers, here's the deal I'm going to offer you. And you've got to say whether, yes, you'll accept the deal, or no, you don't want the deal. And the deal is the top 1%, when I snap my fingers, becomes 20% richer. But wait, before you reject my deal, people in the middle become 3% richer. And people at or near the bottom remain the same as before. In other words, I'm going to snap my fingers, and nobody is worse off than they were before. Some people are better off. Some people are much better off. But I'm a genie, and my snapping my fingers is the equivalent of certain public policies, which we will talk about in the second half of the course. Uh, and I want to know from you, basically, whether you'll agree or disagree. So A is accept the deal, and B is reject it. Ready? I'm about to snap. Go. OK, let's end the bidding there, see whether you want me to snap my fingers. Let's see. Go. Well, 73% of you say you're going to reject the deal. 27% of you are willing to accept the deal, but those who are, most of you are rejecting my deal. Remember, nobody is worse off. Everybody is at least, somebody is better off. In economics, this is called a Pareto improvement. A lot of economists and people who are persuaded by economists say this is unambiguously good. Well, I'm disappointed in you, at least those of you. Who, who voted against this? Uh, why? Because I want the people at the bottom to get something. You want the people on the bottom to get something. things to stay the same. You don't want things to stay the same. You want people on the bottom to get something. But, but, what, but wait a minute. Nobody's, the people at the bottom aren't worse off. The people in the middle are better off, and the people in the top are better off. So why are you, is it envy? What's going on? It's not envy, but I want my piece of the pie. Wait a minute. It's not envy, but you want your piece of the pie, so you're willing to sacrifice the middle and everybody at the top? All right, give you a better deal. Give you a better deal. OK, I'm going to give you a better deal. This is my revised deal. And I'm sorry, what's your name? Spring. 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 I follow you on Facebook, too. Oh, well, <laughs> of course, Spring. You're the one. I, I just, I'm so, it's great to meet you in person. Spring, I got a better deal for you. And anybody else who didn't like my first deal, you'll love this one. And you'll like this one, too. Uh, because here's my deal. The top 1% becomes 20% richer. That was what we had before. Uh, the people in the middle become 10% richer, pretty much better than the 3%. And people out or near the bottom, 2% richer for spring. No. Spring, you got it. They're better off. Better off, better off. Although, OK. Uh, and uh, so all those people who are accept A and B, reject. Go. OK, let's end the bidding there. And let's just take a look. Well, more of you came along, but you're still a majority of you, 58%, still reject my deal. So you're willing to, you're willing to give up an increase in the gains at the bottom for what? Why? Who else besides spring? Yes. What? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. There's no such thing as created wealth? Oh, oh, well, I'm, but there is in the sense that you've got, 
inventors. You've got uh, an economy that is growing. I, told, I showed you how much the economy is growing. I mean, you've got, you've got a way, all sorts of ways of, of, of more wealth and more income being generated over time as the economy become, becomes more productive. I mean, all kinds of wealth. My genie is just a, a sort of a, 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 a stand-in for what has happened. So what's the problem? What's your name? Emily. Lily. Lily. Emily Lily. Lily, Emily? Lily. 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 Well, what's your problem? Why don't you, what, you're willing to sacrifice the gains for people at the bottom? Okay, let, let me just repeat what I think uh, you're saying so everybody else can hear it. You're saying that the wealth, these data on wealth or income increases or even my genie, it's not, we're, we're just taking from Peter to pay Paul. We're taking from the environment. Uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, the climate getting worse, and you don't like the fact that uh, any increase in wealth at the top or anywhere is actually going to be at the expense of the quality of life for other people on the planet. That's what you're saying, isn't it? So it's not about so much inequality here, it's about the trade-offs globally and also in terms of climate, right? That's, that, that's what, sort of what I understand. Well, I, I understand and I respect that, and maybe you, Lily, and you, Spring, and others here would find what I'm now going to suggest, another quote-unquote game, particularly illuminating along those lines. It's an experiment. And let me tell you how it's going to work. You all are going to be divided into couples. Now, I don't mean you are going to be a couple. I don't mean you are going to have to live with a person but next to you. But every one of you, just look to the person to your right or to your left. Okay? And if you don't have somebody to your right or left, if you don't have somebody to your right or left, then then you, you better find somebody because you're going to be pretty lonely in this. No, you're not. OK, here's the experiment. Uh, I, want, I want you to divide up into couples of, and I, on my left, the person on my left is going to get, figuratively, $1,000 from me, figuratively. In fact, let me give you the rules. This is very, and, and, and the rule, the, you know, one rule here is complete silence. This, this game is only would work if everybody's doing it in silence. This is a learning game. Uh, so, and rule is you form couples, and the person on my left is person A, and the person on my right is person B. So, are you two? So you're A and you're B. Uh, you need, neither knows the other. Now, if, the, if you guys are best friends, it's not going to work. Or, but you've got to get into a mindset in which you don't really know each other. And this is a one-time only exchange that we're going to be talking about, or deal. I offer $1,000 to A, and A offers a portion to B and writes it down in complete silence, and then B accepts by writing yes or rejects by writing no. And my $1,000 offer, offer goes through only if B accepts. So what I'd like you to do in complete silence is to do this now. And when you're done, just put up your hands, and then I want to examine it, your deal. When you're done, put up your hands if you are, are OK? Uh, OK, now what I would like to do next is, and this is question number nine, if you were A, person A, I want to know how much 
you offered person B. Uh, now, A is more than $500. B is between $10 and $500. C is between $1 and $9. And D is zero. So again, this is only to be answered by A's. And let's take a look and see, OK, uh, the majority, vast majority of you we're between 10 and 500, but we do have a few of you offered more than 500, and we've got 15 of you who offered between one and nine dollars, and we've got 11 of you who offered zero. Now, I would like to talk to somebody who offered between one dollar and nine dollar. Okay. You offered was. You offered B. What's your name? Henry. Henry, how much did you offer B? A dollar. <laughs> did you accept the dollar? You did not. <laughs> Henry, do you realize you just forfeited 900? I mean, you forfeited a lot of money. Did you expect that your name? Graham. Did you expect that Graham would agree? You hoped he would. <laughs> but that's not my question. Did you expect Graham to agree to one dollar? No? Then why did you offer him one dollar? Well? You, you want to make a point? <laughs> well, you made a point. I'm not sure it's the point you wanted to make. But what point did you want to make? You, oh, I see. You were wanting to make a point that Graham was, would be better off. But Graham, you rejected a dollar. Now, that means you could have had a dollar, Graham. And why did you reject the dollar? You would have accepted $10. <laughs> but why did you reject $1? Like, you, can't really like you can't do anything with a dollar? Yes, you can. You could, you know, you could buy yourself one fifth of a cup of coffee. Or a, <laughs> I mean, what? You mean, in other words, $10 would have done it for you, Graham? <laughs> Graham, wait a minute. I want to just make sure I understand. You would have accepted ten dollars. Yes. That was for our after taxes. <laughs> Spring. <laughs> Hold it. So, so I, well, so you, how do you feel about that? Fine. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else out there who offered, sort of. One dollar, ten dollars, nobody else? Nobody. Well, I know you did because I, I have the evidence up here. Uh, what I'd like, to, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because I want to get at what it was that made you think that B would accept one dollar or five dollars. I mean, it must have been something like B is better off than B was before like we saw right here. All right, let me ask a different question. Is there anybody who offered more than 500? OK, right here. What's your name? Jay. Jay, you offered more than 500. Why did you offer more than 500? Because you're guaranteed an acceptance. And you thought that offering less than 500 might jeopardize the whole thing. And your B, yeah, and, you, and, and your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, and you, and you accepted, would you have accepted something less than 500? 
How much less than 500? You, I'm sorry? You would accept anything? I mean, uh, let me just stop for a second and just explain what we're doing here. We are engaged in a little bit of an experiment about fairness. We all carry around in our heads some notion of what is quote unquote fair. And some of us have very strong ideas about fairness, and some of us has, have kind of mushy ideas about fairness. But in terms of the game we just did, we are putting ourselves in the position of somebody next to us in terms of trying to guess what they think is fair if you are an A person, but a B person, you are responding to your own sense of fairness or unfairness, and if you have a very, very strong sense of what's fair and unfair, you might say no even to a very strong offer if the offer is less than, say, $500. You might. And we could go on and on, and I wish there, were t there was time, and I wish uh, I could go interview you, and we could all interview each other. But you understand that's essentially what we are doing. The purely Pareto improvement, optimal assumption, efficiency, economics, assumes that any gain by B would be enough to make that trade a good trade, just like the genie. Nobody loses anything, everybody gains. But what intrudes on the genie game is the same thing that intruded, for some of you, on the little $1,000 game we just did, and that is your own sense of something about it maybe being un fair. And what we need to do is unpack what that is. We don't have time to do that. Maybe, hopefully, in your sections you can do it. But it's important because as we diagnose what has happened to the economy, what has happened to inequality, why we're concerned about inequality if we are, as we investigate our notions of fairness or lack of fairness become profoundly important. And we've got to understand where they come from. Let me just end on this little anecdote. In 20, well, when I was Secretary of Labor, uh, I would all the time go out to Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina and other places where there were a lot of unionized workers and a lot of manufacturing workers and a lot of non-unionized workers. I didn't consider myself secretary of just unionized America. I was secretary of labor. And I would go out and I would talk with thousands and thousands and thousands of workers, hourly wage workers. And that was in 1990. Starting in 1993, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and what I found as I went out to talk with these workers is a little bit of feeling of being treated unfairly. Now, it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't that they were absolutely angry. But I kind of conducted a free-floating focus group, if you want to put it that way. I would talk to them, you know, how are you doing? How's your family doing? How's your job? And we'd get into their feelings about the system not treating them quite fairly. You know, the bosses are doing great. The executives are doing great. Uh, the stock market, blah, 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 blah. And I'd pick up something everywhere I went, unionized or non-unionized. And then in 2016, Years later, I went back to these same states, sometimes the same people, often their children, 
once in two or three instances, their grandchildren. Uh, and we would talk about just how they're getting on. We'd have these discussions, a free-floating focus group. But I'd ask them the same kind of questions. And what I picked up was much more anger. Now, what I picked up is exactly what you saw in a lot of today's charts. They didn't put it in terms of these charts. They put it in terms of how they felt subjectively about the way the economy was run, the way the system was run, the way politics was being undertaken, the way the powerful people treated them. They were not Democrats or Republicans. They didn't put Democrats or Republicans the first thing. They didn't, they didn't begin with their political philosophy. They just began with their, their feelings about how they were being treated. And they were angrier, substantially angrier in 2016 than they were 20 years before. And then I would ask them in 2016, well, who are you interested in in terms of presidency? I mean, we were just on the verge of the 2016 election. Uh, we were still months away. In fact, we were still before the nomination. But we were on the verge of the 2016 election. And I'd say, well, who's, who's interesting to you? And over and over and over again, in Ohio and Michigan and Minnesota and North Carolina and, Ohio, I mean, I would hear in Pennsylvania the same two names. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, often from the same people. Now, I want to suggest to you that the subject of this class is directly and powerfully related to the subject of democracy and the quality and capacity of our country to survive whether you are worried about climate change or you're worried about anything else. I want to suggest to you that much of what we are going to be talking about over the next 14 weeks is happening now. This is not an exercise in theory. This is an exercise in understanding reality, understanding a system a political economic system moving through time. It's going to be a wild ride. Thank you for joining me.